Hello and welcome to The Olive Tree with me, Julia Fisher, the program that brings you news from believers in Jesus living in Israel today to find out what God is doing there. My guest is Christa Baer. She's a Christian from Germany who from an early age became concerned at her nation's role during the Second World War in sending so many Jewish people to their deaths during the Holocaust. She eventually moved to live in Jerusalem in 1991, and her aim was, and still is, to promote repentance and reconciliation of the Church of Jesus from the nations towards Israel. Krista, welcome back. We're going to continue your story now. As I mentioned in the previous program, you're sat overlooking the Sea of Galilee there in Migdal in northern Israel, and I'm here in South Wales. And through this miracle of technology, we can make this program. So we'd reached the point in your story where you had just felt so persuaded by God to move to Israel. And you made that move in 1991, and you actually bought a house. That must have been quite something. Yes. So not that I did have really money to buy a house, but I will explain how it happened. I fixed up a little apartment and invested a lot of time and money to make it nice. And it was actually an apartment of a friend, the worship leader in the congregation. And he told me after five months that sadly he has to sell the apartment and that I have to leave. So I was very, very sad that I invested so much in this apartment and now I needed to leave again. So it brought some real questions, what what I'm doing here. And uh, then I read a a scripture from the book of um, Isaiah, of the prophet Isaiah, and it's written there, from now on you will not build houses and not live in it. If you build a house, you will also live in it. And that's exactly how I felt, that I built a house and I couldn't live in it. And uh, so then I asked people, how can I live as a foreigner for a longer time in uh, in a house in Israel? And they said, only if you buy it. So then I thought, well, maybe, maybe God wants me to buy a house, even that I don't have money, but he can, he can do it. And I read another scripture. There's no one who leaves father, mother, brothers, sisters, acres, houses, who doesn't get in this life houses, acres. And uh, I never paid attention that there's written houses. And I thought, really, I left everything. So God can provide for me. And um, I uh, rented a, a house. Uh, with other immigrants together. It was only available available for 11 months. And uh, I wrote in my newsletter that I believe God wants to give me a house. And there was um, a sister in Austria, a sister of uh, nobility, and she had a dream that she was buying a house in Jerusalem. And uh, then she opened the Bible And there was written in Jeremiah, uh, buy houses and acres around Jerusalem. And uh, she called me up and she said, I have $280,000. If you find the house, I pay for it. And uh, so I started to really look around. (laughs) But I wanted to have a house with a big uh, uh, living room so that we can meet. And I didn't find it. So it made me a little tired. So then I said, okay, I just wait now what's going to happen. And a half year later, the lawyer came and said, the house I'm renting is for sale. And I knew that it was that house, actually, that I didn't need to move anymore. I rented it already. It was $100,000 more expensive. And uh, this uh, sister, she paid in the end for everything for also for the missing hundred thousand dollar and uh, so she paid for the whole house including tax and uh, everything you were getting started you were making contacts things were starting to come together for you where did you begin with with meeting people and your concern about reconciliation and repentance how did it start to work 
Um, I joined a, a congregation in Christchurch in the center of Jerusalem, and the leaders of that congregation, they uh, were actually children of Holocaust survivors from Austria and from Germany. And uh, the whole story and history came very close because they grew up under the shade of the Holocaust because their aunts, their uncles, their grandparents, they died in Auschwitz. And I could see that this is not so far away. There are people who grew up, who are a little bit older than me, who never saw their grandmother, their grandfather, their uncle and auntie, because they all were killed in Auschwitz. So this brought it very close, the subject to me, and also the effect. By the way, in Israel, you meet a lot of people who suffer uh, in the second and third generation under the Holocaust because they didn't have a grandmother, because they always were growing up under the shade of the Holocaust. So it becomes very real. And uh, then I started to prepare my first um, service, a uh, repentance service in a former concentration camp in Bergen-Belsen. Before I traveled with uh, Jewish brethren to Germany, we spoke in different churches, they told their story and uh, I gave a short testimony. So and, you were, can I just yeah? interrupt you there, but Krista, you were, you had found Jewish believers who were prepared to work with you as a German yes. Christian in this area of repentance and forgiveness. Right. That's that's quite something. That's a big step right. for both parties to take. That's right. Uh, they, that was that was Jewish believers, and much later, I even found Holocaust survivors who have been in Auschwitz, who came with me to Poland, and. Um, and we uh, went to these camps together uh, with the, with the Holocaust survivors. But I maybe I start first with the the first ones who were willing were Jewish believers in Yeshua, and uh, we visited uh, Bergen Belsen. And actually, in 1994, I prepared repentance services in all the concentration camps in uh, Germany and in Austria. And uh, you could see that many people have never been in this, many believers, Christians, have never been in these places, even that they were near, very near to their house. So they you would take... You're talking yeah. about German Christians and Austrian yes. Christians now. Yes, they could have lived 10 kilometers near to the to a former concentration camp, but they never entered in. And to invite to a meeting of repentance in these camps made them uh, think about it and come and face the history. And I could see that... Uh, how it touched the people, it was much stronger than get, giving a lecture about the Holocaust. It was much stronger to be on the place where you see, here were the barracks, here was the gas chambers. And uh, I remember there was a very deep meeting in Buchenwald where around 300 people came and also the Mary sisters from Darmstadt. And the Mary sisters, the Lutheran Mary sisters from Darmstadt, they were the first ones who called for repentance after the Second World War. And uh, now this repentance services, they took another circle, especially in the Lutheran Church, but also some Catholic uh, brethren joined us. But it was mainly the Lutheran Church and some free churches who joined. Was there a reluctance at first in those early days for German Christians to join you in this way with Jewish believers and yes, people from it Israel? Yes, it was something totally new, but it was the Kairos. It was the time where God really wanted to people to face very real the history and then to meet 
a child of a Holocaust survivor where who could say, yeah, my grandparents died in Auschwitz or uh, other people came. They even knew people who were in Matthausen or were in other places in I maybe I just say the names of the camps. It's uh, Sachsenhausen near to Berlin, Ravensbrück in East Germany, where also Corrie ten Boom was, and um, Neuengamen near to Hamburg, Bergen-Belsen near to Hannover, uh, Dachau near to München, and Flössenburg, where also um, near to Regensburg, where also Dietrich Bonhoeffer died. And uh, Dora Mittelbau, it's near to Nordhausen. And Buchenwald, uh, it's uh, near to Weimar. And uh, then some other camps I found later. And then in, in Austria, Matthausen. And also in Austria later, we visited Gusen, which was uh, even a much worse camp, which uh, no one knew about it. It's only lately that Gusen is coming into the uh, light, what happened in Gusen. Really? So then we went 1993 to Auschwitz, and uh, Auschwitz was um, a total new dimension of a concentration camp. So big, so huge, so far as you can see, chimneys, um, barracks, and it, it brought me into a kind of shock that uh, this was so, so big. And I felt like frozen that in my, in my emotions, I couldn't comprehend that this big, big um, killing machinery really, that this took place. And um, I also went there with uh, uh, Benjamin and Ruven Berger. And they were there the first time where their family was killed, their grandfather, grandmother. And it was very, very moving, very, very, very sad. Very, very sad. Yeah. And uh, I really, as I came home, I just needed to think about Auschwitz and I started to weep. It was beyond my comprehension what really took place there. But you know, all this is the reason for you living in Jerusalem, Krista. And in our next program, we're going to talk about the community, the community of Zion that you have formed in Jerusalem and how many years later you are seeing the fruit of this work. So thank you for joining us today. We look forward to talking to you in the next program. Olive Tree Reconciliation Fund is a Christian charity based in the UK that supports the needs of both Jewish believers and Arab or Palestinian Christians living in Israel and the wider Middle East. If you'd like to know more about our work and receive our free bi-monthly newsletter, please visit our website, olivetreefund.org. Meanwhile, join me at the same time next week for another story from the Olive Tree. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.